Joseph Big Joey Massino was the legendary godfather of the Bonanno crime family. To the FBI, he was known as the Last Dawn. He absolutely crushed anyone who went against the mafia code of Omerta. Joe Massino was considered the Last Dawn because he was really the last of the old guard. He was feared absolutely because he was a violent man and his reputation preceded him. Loyalty to his family and obedience to their code of silence was everything. And he was determined to keep it that way, going to any extreme to protect his secrets. Joe Messina would not speak in a group setting. If he wanted to talk criminal activity, he would walk outside with at least one person, maybe two. He would walk around the block. Um, he would put his hands over his lips to avoid any type of uh, recording that, that a lip reader could possibly translate. When the family was infiltrated by the legendary undercover agent Donnie Brasco, it spelled the end for the Bonanos and for the Mafia. But the last Don refused to cooperate, causing big problems for the feds. Joe Messina threatened people with death. Messino was the key to the family, um, so what I had to do was find the key to Messino. I never thought Joe Messina would cooperate. But when Massino finally went down for good, he'd take everyone with him, like no other Mafia boss had ever done before him. This is Mafia. On August 14, 1981, Sonny Black Napolitano went to one of his regular hangouts in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. He was a captain in the Bonanno family, and the Motion Lounge was one of their headquarters. Sonny walked up to the barman and handed him the keys to his apartment, a big stash of cash and the diamond-encrusted rings from his fingers. He told the barman that he was going to a meeting and that he didn't know if he was coming back. Big Joey Massino, at the time a powerful Bonanno underboss, had taken out a contract on Sonny. Tony De Stefano is the author of King of American Godfathers. Sonny Black was taken to a house in uh, order to a meeting in a house in Staten Island, uh, was pushed into the basement and was killed uh, and shot several times. And he knew what was happening. And he supposedly his last words were, uh, you know, if you're going to do it, uh, you know, make it good and uh, make it quick, basically. And he was taken out, buried in a place on Staten Island, and some months later his body was discovered quite by chance. And uh, that was the end of Sonny Black. Sonny Black's mistake had been consequential and unforgivable. He had fallen for the cover story of FBI Special Agent Joe Pistone, who's better known as Donnie Brasco. Donnie Brasco was the uh, stage name for Special Agent uh, Joseph Pistone of the FBI. Uh, Pistone was the fellow who in the uh, uh, late 1970s and early 1980s penetrated the Bonanno crime family by posing as Donnie Brasco, a sort of uh, two-bit thief, a uh, guy who dealt in stolen property and jewels and ingratiated himself with the crime family. And he was able to dispose of stolen property because he had the FBI secretly working with him to dispose of the property and provide him with cash as a way of showing, uh, you know, results. So the crime family became to look upon Joe Pistone, Donnie Brasco, as somebody who was very valuable. Not only had he believed the undercover agent, but Sonny Black had taken him under his wing and helped him rise in the Mafia ranks. Black was the most senior member to be deceived, and for six years, he allowed Brasco access to the Bonanno family's dirtiest secrets. Former FBI Special Agent Pat Colgan. He gathered tremendous intelligence information by just being able to transfer what he was learning to his contacts in the FBI who were trying to determine what members of the Bonanno organized crime family were planning in the future. He was a phenomenal asset for the FBI in the area of criminal activities and organized crime. Joe Pistone's undercover work was so credible and so good 
Sonny Black and Brasco became close friends. Sonny Black even recommended Brasco for induction into the Bonanno family as a made man. Hey, Mafia fans. Here's a secret I just can't stay silent about. We have officially launched a merch store, and it's live on Audioboom right now. If you love Mafia and want to show your support, head over to audioboom.com forward slash merch forward slash Mafia. You can buy a nice mug, a phone case that the FBI hasn't tapped, or a journal to keep a list of people you can trust. Or maybe those you can't. You'll be as stylish as Lucky Luciano. Be sure to keep an eye on the store as new designs and products get added regularly. That's audioboom.com forward slash merch forward slash mafia. Thanks for your support. Selwyn Rabb is the author of Five Families. Napolitano had taken Pistone in almost as one of his right-hand men. And he wanted him to be made, inducted as a made soldier. The idea that an FBI agent could infiltrate and almost become a made member was unbelievable. But once the truth was known, Massino didn't take it lightly. Not only were they humiliated and compromised, but this revelation could bring down the entire Bonanno crime organization. And in Massino's mind... This disaster rested squarely on Sonny Black's shoulders. This was an unbelievable sin, and uh, the Palatano was the first victim of the purge. He was bumped off, whacked almost immediately after, after Pistone surfaced. One of, the, one of the events that came out of Pistone's uh, infiltration was that it led to Joe Messino becoming an important player in the Bonanno family. For years, the Bonanno crime family had been mistrusted by the other families. An old boss, Carmine Galante, had tried to take over their rackets in his quest to become the boss of all bosses, which didn't sit well with the rest of the families. When Galante was killed in 1979, Joe Massino had started building a successful family on the foundations of secrecy and loyalty. But by trusting Pistone... Sonny Black had undone everything, and Black's death was only the beginning. Massino also put a hit on Benjamin Lefty Ruggiero, who had also helped Pistone along. But Ruggiero was arrested before he could be assassinated. A third man was not so lucky. Anthony Mira had introduced Brasco to Sonny Black, determined to make the point that loyalty is more important than blood. Massino ordered the execution to be carried out by Mira's cousin. Crime author Tony Stefano. Well, I think the murders that you saw in the Bonanno crime family, beginning with uh, Sonny Black and the others, was definitely an indication of how ruthless and businesslike uh, Massino could be. Uh, and I also think some of the murders that he took part in or inspired were his way of cleaning house, trying to get rid of people who might be able to implicate him in the very murders he was involved in and sort of other crimes he was taking part in. Massino was trying to put things back in order, but the lasting damage had already been done. Brasco's information was enough to indict six of the Bonanno's members on charges of murder. Massino himself was convicted for racketeering and sentenced to ten years in jail. So uh, the family, the Bonanno families, were looked upon as undesirables by everybody else in the New York and National Mafia. Pistone's infiltration uh, almost completely destroyed the uh, Bonanno family. Nobody wanted to deal with them anymore. They were so untrustworthy. But even worse for Massino, Donnie Brasco's intel on the Bonanno family led to the indictment of 50 mobsters, including senior members of New York's four other Mafia families. Massino wanted to rebuild the family with a reputation of secrecy, but now the other families only saw them as a liability. Former FBI Special Agent Jack Steubing. The, the repercussions of, uh, of the uh, revelation that Donnie Brasco had, had infiltrated the family were staggering. Um, 
the uh, the, the family was uh, basically in chaos. Uh, the other four families uh, treated the Bonanos like they were radioactive. Um, and uh, uh, it caused a lot of... Um, ripple effect throughout the organized crime uh, scene in New York. Uh, well, there were, there were significant prosecutions. I mean, uh, the, uh, the ultimate uh, was the so-called commission case in which they indicted the, the people who were believed to be the heads of the five families. Um, and that was, uh, again, a dramatic uh, situation for, for the families. The mafia's main governing body, the commission, cut the Bonanos out of all of their syndicated rackets. It was a devastating blow to Joe Massino. His reputation and his family's multi-million dollar income were in the gutter. But for the FBI, it was a triumph. Former FBI Special Agent Pat Colgan was on the Bonanno squad. Well, needless to say, the convictions of many of the Bonanno family members, including Joe Massino, was very satisfying to uh, many law enforcement people who, who uh, were involved in the investigations. But by no means did law enforcement think we had eradicated the entire crime problem. That, that was never the case. But it did have a, a detrimental effect on the organized crime family. Yet one big fish had eluded their net. Somehow Massino's second-in-command, Salvatore Vitale, had escaped indictment and was still on the outside. The FBI suspected that Vitale was continuing the family business, so they began staking out his HQ. Over a few weeks, the FBI recorded enough evidence of racketeering to convict several members of Vitale's crew, but they fell short of catching the man himself. Jack Steubing, who headed the team, remembers the frustration. We indicted uh, several uh, members and associates of the Bonanno family, but uh, Sal Vitale wasn't one of them, although we had a um, uh, microphone inside the club and actually a microphone outside the club, and we had CCTV inside the club. Um, Vitale was not uh, caught in the act of committing any criminal acts, and so he was never indicted as part of that investigation. But because Joe Massino was behind bars, and now so many associates were out of action, it seemed as though the Bonanno family was done for good. The FBI shut down the Bonanno squad, and the agents were reassigned to other families. Law enforcement has limited resources. They can, uh, they can only address so many problems at the same time. Um, and uh, with the outbreak simultaneously of the Colombo War, the combined resources of the squad that was now tasked with both the Bonanno and Colombo families were largely devoted to um, be taking care of the Colombo War. The Colombo family had a history of fraught leadership, and they were once again killing each other. The FBI was tasked with containing it. Meanwhile, Joe Massino was determined to get back on his feet again. He began to rebuild his family and his reputation from behind bars. And he knew the person on the outside who could help him, Sal Vitale. Well, Messino and uh, Vitale were uh, brothers-in-law. Vitale was married to uh, Messino's sister. They had a very close relationship uh, growing up. One of the stories that's often told about it is that uh, Messino taught Vitale how to swim, for example. Um, and was a, sort of a surrogate big brother, father to figure two, Vitale. And as Messino's literal family member, Sal Vitale was allowed to visit the boss in prison. Joe Messina was, of course, allowed to have visitors wherever he physically was, was located at that time in the prison system. So Sal Vitale would visit him in, in jail. Joe Messina's wife would visit him in jail and and be given coded type messages. Um, uh, Sal Vitale's wife would visit Joe Messina in jail and also be given coded messages transmitting back to Sal Vitale. Joe was still effectively the head of the Bonanno organized crime, crime family, even though he was in jail. Sal Vitale was definitely 
effectively running the Bonanno organized crime family at Joe Messina's request. The prison visits became mafia meetings. With Messina's direction, Vitali slowly started rebuilding the Bonanno empire. But the exclusion of the family from large syndicated mafia rackets meant their profits were low. Vitali was forced to start again from scratch. Uh, there were always crews in the Bonanno family that were involved in narcotics trafficking, but they became a little more blatant about it. They turned to dealing hard drugs to raise cash. But as drug use surged, it became a multi-million dollar business. And the Bonanno family cashed in. The FBI had been concentrating on the other four families during that time. The rise from the ashes of the Bonanos flew under their radar. There's very limited intelligence on the Bonanno family while Joe Messina was in jail. So the family, during a really major crackdown by the FBI, the family was out of the loop. Hey, listeners, I want to tell you about another podcast I think you might like. Uncover. Escaping Nexium takes you inside a bizarre self-help group that attracted actors, politicians, the super wealthy, and even a visit from the Dalai Lama. The series tells the story of one woman who went from being their star recruiter to leading the fight to take it down. Subscribe to Uncover Escaping Nexium on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get Mafia. When he was eventually released... Massina would be more powerful than ever, and ironically, it was Donnie Brasco that he'd have to thank for it. When Joseph Massina walked out of prison in November 1992, as far as the FBI were concerned, the crime boss and his family were not a threat. But thanks to Sal Vitale, Massina was once again the boss of a thriving Bonanno crime family. Crime author Selwyn Rabb. He brought them back into stardom. They became probably, at one point, the most important family in New York for a variety of reasons, one of which was Messino's safeguards and his whole policy and his philosophy of making sure that the family would never be infiltrated again. We had very poor um, uh, informant coverage. Um, the Bonanos didn't have anyone who had uh, turned... Uh, to become a, a government cooperator. And um, we were really starting from scratch. Um, the cases that we had had in the pipeline had been wrapped up and um, we were entering the, the age of Messino, basically. It wasn't long before the FBI heard rumors that he was back running the show. Restarting investigations into Bonanno activities, Jack Steubing made it a priority to gather as much new intelligence as he could. Messino was the key to the family, um, so what I had to do was find the key to Messino. Steubing's squad tried to put pressure on known informants to build a profile of his new associates. One of the things that I've always preached in, um, in these kind of investigations is that uh, you don't go head on for the main guy. You start probing around for who the weak spots are around him because the guy who's at the top of the pyramid got there because he's got his wits about him. Um, and so you're looking for somebody who's maybe not so sharp. But the squad hit a brick wall. No one seemed to know what Massino and his men were up to, or no one was willing to talk. Massino had learned a valuable lesson in ensuring the loyalty of his soldiers. Bonanos were frightened for their lives. Nobody would say a word against him. No one would talk to us about Joe Messina because they feared him. He was feared absolutely because he was a violent man and his reputation preceded him. Joe Messina threatened people with death. That's a great motivator. And yes, everyone knew on the street that he was quite capable, quite lethal. Despite round-the-clock surveillance of Messina's HQ, Steubing found it impossible to get anything on him or his soldiers. Joe Messina would not speak in a group setting. If he wanted to talk criminal activity, he would walk outside with at least one person, maybe two. He would walk around the block. Um, he would put his hands over his lips 
to avoid any type of uh, uh, recording that, that a lip reader could possibly translate. Uh, he would never use a telephone and talk substance of a criminal action or planning a criminal action. Uh, Joe Mas Messina was very, very smart and discreet. He communicated face-to-face. -face. Um, he was very selective in who he did meet. He wouldn't just meet uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry off the street. He had to know them or be assured by somebody else that this was a trusted person. Joe Messina tried to figure out the mistakes everybody else had made and the other families and his own family. He built these protective walls. Nobody really spoke on the phone. Nobody spoke um, in clubhouses. They didn't exist anymore. With his surveillance and wiretaps failing, Steubing had no choice but to go in and check out the scene himself. My training in organized crime uh, was always that uh, you should try and get to know your adversaries personally. Um, and I decided... Uh, this was shortly before I became the uh, the supervisor of the squad to go out and visit him at uh, his business and see what he was all about. He had a catering business out on Long Island uh, called King Caterers, uh, which uh, was responsible for um, uh, what were known as roach coaches, these uh, trucks that visit construction sites and, and uh, sell sandwiches and um, uh, coffee to, to workers, and his trucks uh, reportedly also provided services such as uh, loan shark loans and, and taking bets. Steubing turned up unannounced and headed inside the caterers, and he had no idea how the brutal crime boss might react. So I visited Messino at his facility, and he was back in the kitchen uh, making sauce or, or, or something, and then uh, I took the approach with him that uh, I had... Uh, been watching him, which he of course knew, and uh, I engaged him in conversation, and, and the approach that I had taken was that, uh, uh, you know, I know you're uh, trying to go straight, and you're not in the life anymore, and uh, that kind of thing, and he knew I didn't believe it, and he didn't believe I believed it, um, so, uh, but it gave us the opportunity to have a, a conversation, because uh, as much as I wanted to see what he was all about, he wanted to see what I was all about and what I knew. Steubing realized that Messino's men had been watching his agents as much as his agents had been watching Messino. He told me about uh, surveillances that uh, he had been the subject of, and I knew he knew what he was talking about because I'd been on some of those surveillances. He could physically describe agents. He knew what cars we drove. He had partial license plate numbers. Um, he knew uh, pretty much everything that was in our bag of tricks up to that time in uh, investigating organized crime and what had been successful and what hadn't been successful. And um, uh, he, it was clear that he was uh, somebody that, uh, that had his wits about him and, and was a master of his craft. And um, so anyway, uh, when, uh, when I was leaving him... Uh, we shook hands and I said to him, uh, uh, you know, maybe I'm just stupid, but uh, we really haven't caught you doing anything. And he looked at me and he says, you're not stupid. And I left and I thought, neither are you. <laughs> Steubing had come out of the meeting unscathed, but now Massino knew where the FBI stood and he tightened his security even further. First of all, he abolished the idea that they would meet in social clubs, easy places to infiltrate and to conduct surveillances by the FBI and other agents. He also decided that he would create bulletproof situations. Each capo in his family, who he considered to be very loyal to him, would only know about one aspect of the family's wealth and operations. And he also determined every capo in the family should get his sons or near relatives made as inducted soldiers. The idea being that if you ratted, you endangered not just yourself, but your relatives, including your next of kin. So he tried to build these protective barriers and walls 
where nobody knew too much except him. And by this way, he de determined that he wouldn't make the mistakes that other bosses have made, that trusting too many people and allowing somebody to infiltrate. Here's why I'm a big fan of Simply Safe home security. Simply Safe is ready for anything that gets thrown at it. A storm takes out your power. Simply Safe is ready. An intruder cuts your phone line. Simply Safe is ready. But what if they disable your keypad or siren? Simply Safe will get you the help you need. Sure, maybe it's overkill. Maybe you don't need to be ready for every worst case scenario. But that's what makes Simply Safe's home security system so great. It's always ready. So now you're thinking, that's cool, but Simply Safe has got to cost an arm and a leg. But that's just it. It doesn't. They only charge you what's fair. 24-7 professional security monitoring is just $14.99 a month. $14.99! Now, ask yourself how much you spend on coffee every month. And they're so confident that you'll love it. There are no contracts and no hidden fees. I've got it set up in my living room, and not only is it fun to look at, I feel safer every time I pass by. I recommend Simply Safe to everyone I know. You've got to check it out. Go to simplysafe.com forward slash mafia today. That's simplysafe.com forward slash mafia to protect your home and family today. Simplysafe.com forward slash mafia. With the FBI unable to make a move and his soldiers remaining loyal, Massino's crime empire continued to expand. At the same time, FBI investigations into the other families were reaping rewards. Lawyers prepared for what became known as the Commission Trials. These trials proved participation in huge syndicated rackets, worth tens of millions of dollars. The bosses of all four of the other New York Mafia families were sent to prison. For organized crime, it was a devastating blow. But for Joe Massino, it cleared the field. He was the last man standing, and so the FBI nicknamed him the Last Don. Joe Messina was considered the Last Don because he was really the last of the old guard, the only left significant player left on the street. And it was all thanks to Donnie Brasco. In a way, Pistone did the Bonanno crime family a favor because the impact was to shield the family from involvement in any of the other major mafia rackets because the family was shunned and the other families didn't want them involved. So the family, the Bonanno family, had to go out and make its money its own way. And since uh, it really insulated the family from scrutiny uh, by federal authorities for the longest period of time. By the mid-1990s, there was still a complete wall of silence surrounding Messino's soldiers. To the FBI, the last Don seemed untouchable. But then Jack Steuben got lucky. A secret informant squealed, not on Messino himself, but his loyal number two, Sal Vitale. It was the breakthrough he'd been waiting for. It turned out that Sal Vitale had been using a bank on Long Island to launder cash, as well as to extort gambling and loan sharking debts. Regular customers used the front entrance, but Sal Vitale used an entrance around the back. The FBI didn't hesitate. They moved in, indicting Vitale along with six of his associates and the bank's manager for racketeering. They had put Vitale behind bars, but couldn't yet tie anything back to Massino himself. However, Vitale was given an unusually short prison sentence, and it had an unexpected effect on the family, especially Joe Massino. Vitale's of trouble with the bank case on Long Island was something that created suspicion among other members of the crime family, uh, not necessarily Messino at first, that Sal might be cooperating because he got a relatively light sentence. You know, some people in the world of the mafia, you get a light sentence, it could be just a fluke of the sentencing guidelines, but everybody gets paranoid and thinks that, well, maybe that's a sign that somebody's cooperating. Gripped by paranoia, 
Messino didn't know what to do next. Vitali would be even more dangerous than Donny Brasco. So dangerous that Massino might have to have his brother-in-law killed. In the next episode, their success with Vitali still didn't bring the FBI hope for taking down Joseph Massino, so they had to find alternate methods. I became convinced more than ever that uh, he knew so much about how we operated that we were going to have to try something that we hadn't tried before. He was uh, certainly on uh, red alert as far as uh, uh, any uh, informants we could develop or uh, penetrating with another undercover agent. Uh, he was certainly well aware of our surveillance techniques and uh, it was time for a new approach. The feds tightened the screw on Massino's most loyal soldiers, making them flip one after the other and tell on their ruthless and brutal boss. Weinberg was a very nervous guy. Um, we did not think that he would be capable of spending any time in jail, and we figured if we targeted him, which we did, um, and we targeted him through a uh, covert financial investigation, that if we arrested him, that he would cooperate with us and give us an inside look into the Bonanno organized crime family. And in the end, Joe Messino was cornered to such an extent by the FBI that he did the unprecedented what no other official mob boss had ever done before him. The man who was against anybody talking now became the biggest blabbermouth, and he undid everything that he had created over 20 years. This has been an Audio Boom and World Media Rights co-production, hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley and Rachel Jacobs and Bettina Vasquez for World Media Rights. We had editing help from David Markowitz, with additional production from World Media Rights by Gerald Zibengua. David McNabb is the series' creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Reagan and Stuart Last. Thanks to Simply Safe and CBC's podcast, Someone Knows Something, for sponsoring this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And if you've got some time, give us a review.